Your Highness, Madam Clarkson, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, and friends of pluralism and the Pluralism Center. Thank you, first of all, Your Highness, for those kind uh, remarks. Uh, it means a great deal coming from you, and I will cherish them. It is an honor to have been invited to give the fourth annual Pluralism Lecture. And it is a special privilege to be doing so in this magnificent building set in this beautifully serene space. What riches, Your Highness, and those you serve have brought to our country and to this city. Merci beaucoup. The annual pluralism lecture invites us to examine answers to what His Highness the Aga Khan described three days ago when he opened the Khan Gardens as an age-old and profound question. The question is this, in his own words, how can humankind honor what is distinctive about our separate identities and at the same time see diversity as a source of inspiration and blessing? Rather than fearing difference, how can we learn to embrace difference so that we may live together more peacefully and productively? End of quote. More and more, this is the question that societies everywhere are facing. It is a question with which Canada has been grappling from its beginnings. One answer to the Aga Khan's age-old and profound question lies in the notion of tolerance. Tolerance in the sense of a willingness to allow the existence of opinions and behavior with which one does not necessarily agree. To live harmoniously in a diverse pluralistic society demands great generosity of spirit and openness of mind, a willingness to accept difference and indeed to celebrate it. Tolerance in this broad sense and the need for it is my theme tonight. Canada is a diverse multicultural state and with that comes a plethora of diverse religions, opinions and behaviors. History shows that there are two ways societies can deal with diversity of opinion and behavior. The first is to confine, minimize, or eject, reject those who have different views and behaviors. This is the response of segregation and the ghetto, the response of marginalizing discrimination, the response in extreme cases of exile and genocide. The second approach to diversity is to adopt an attitude of tolerance, une attitude de tolérance, a willingness to live with people who are different from us, what Jean-Paul Sartre called the other, and to coexist with opinions and behaviors we may not agree with. Most modern multicultural nations have, sometimes after great struggle and trauma, adopted the second approach of tolerance. They have rejected the responses of segregation, discrimination, and exile. These cause too much pain, and in the end, history teaches they do not work. The only way forward, these societies believe, is to move forward together in all our diversity. We may not necessarily agree with the behaviors and opinions forced by some of those with whom we are required to share our communal space. 
but we must be willing to allow them to voice those opinions or act as their particular religion or values dictate. This is what His Highness the Aga Khan has called the cosmopolitan ethic. In a modern democratic society, tolerance must be the norm. It is the point of departure, the default position. But tolerance, most people would agree, has its limits. There may be some things that cannot and should not be tolerated in a civilized society, but because they harm individuals or harm the body politic. Sometimes it is right to be intolerant. Parfois, il est acceptable d'être intolérant. Mais quand? This brings us to one of the great debates of the modern multicultural society, the debate between tolerance and intolerance and where we should draw the line. It is not a question of either tolerance or intolerance. As I've said, in a democracy, tolerance is the default position, the norm. It is rather a question of where we draw the line between behaviors and opinions that should be tolerated, the vast majority, and behaviors or opinions that are so nefarious they cannot be accepted in civilized society. Where to draw the line in a particular situation may be neither easy nor obvious. The task of drawing the line when opinions differ falls first to citizens. Fair-minded people, however, may draw the line in different places. When they can cannot, the task of drawing lines between what is accepted and what cannot be accepted falls to legislators and the courts. Today, I'd like to explore the interface between tolerance and intolerance in Canadian society. I will begin by placing tolerance within a broader context, the philosophical and Canadian historical context which shapes the debate. I'll then turn to the limits on tolerance, using some examples drawn from cases that have come before the courts. And I will conclude by describing three conditions that I believe are essential to maintaining the norm of tolerance in a diverse, pluralistic society. First, insisting on the human dignity of each person and respect for that dignity. Second, fostering inclusive institutions and cultural attitudes in civil society. And third, maintaining the rule of law. Let me begin with the philosophical and historical context. A perusal of the works of John Milton, John Stuart Mill, John Dewey, John Rawls, and others indicates that tolerance is a cornerstone of democratic societies. It is a necessary condition of peace in a pluralistic society. This said, Scholars are quick to point out that tolerance is not the ideal, not the highest expression of how diverse pluralistic societies should live together. Tolerance has its critics. It has been criticized as a term for interaction, and I quote, anchored too much in the old idea of mutual indulgence and not enough in the more constructive idea of active embrace. Tolerance without more suggests that it is enough for us to merely put up with one another, to retain our biases and our inclinations to make culturally centric judgments. Tolerance demands, the critics say, that we do a certain amount of important and positive external work, but leaves the inside unchanged. I believe that tolerance in the broad sense that I enunciated at the beginning of this lecture does more than that. It does not allow us to retain our internal biases. It commands, on, commands us to respect, mutually respect differences. And it commands us to understand the richness that comes from the respect for those differences. And I believe that if we begin with tolerance, we will end with inclusiveness, which is the ideal for all. The question becomes, at the starting point that we in our societies often find ourselves, what should be tolerated? The hard reality of day-to-day -day life is that citizens living in a diverse multicultural society 
even those who consider themselves fair-minded and unbiased, sometimes confront beliefs and practices with which they do not agree. Indeed, in some cases that they may abhor. This puts the question squarely before them. Where does a tolerant society draw the line? This brings me to the historic context, very briefly. The historical context in which Canadian tolerance is embedded. Canada sees itself and is seen by others as a nation of tolerance. We are a peaceful, multicultural country. One of us, John Humphreys, was a principal drafter in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. And in 1982, we adopted our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, constitutionally our commitment to freedom of religion, equality, and a multicultural society. The court on which I serve has said this, Canada rightly prides itself on its evolutionary tolerance for diversity and pluralism. This journey has included a growing appreciation for multiculturalism, including the recognition that ethnic, religious, and cultural differences will be acknowledged and respected. And in the end, the right to integrate into Canada's mainstream, based on and notwithstanding these differences, has become part of our national character. A part of our national character of which I am enormously proud. We like to boast that Canada came together by the, the mingling of three peoples, our First Nations, the French, and the English. It is, and, and since then, it has been built on successive waves of immigration, a tradition we maintain to this day. We accept refugees and immigrants from all parts of the world and from all cultures. When the Ismaili community in East Africa faced expulsion, we opened the doors to them. A decade later, we once again opened our doors to fleeing Vietnamese refugees. In the years that have followed, many thousands of people fleeing war and persecution around the globe have found homes in Canada. Canada has been enormously enriched by the presence in its midst of these people and their contributions. Yet while celebrating our inclusionary historical record, we should not forget its blemishes. N'oublions pas qu'elle n'est pas sans tâche. In the 19th century, we welcomed Chinese men to build our railroads, dangerous and arduous work, but denied them the right to bring their wives and families unless they paid a head tax, a tax which remained on the books until well into the 20th century. When Jews fleeing the Holocaust in 1939 aboard the St. Louis sought refuge in Canada, we turned them away. Denied entry here and in the United States, they returned to Europe, where many of them perished. When Japan bombed Pearl Harbor in World War II, we dispossessed the Japanese population of British Columbia of their homes and businesses and locked them up in concentration camps. And slavery was not unknown in our country in 18th and 19th centuries. Black people suffered systemic ex exclusion throughout much of the 20th century. The most glaring blemish on, Canadian, on the Canadian historic record relates to our treatment of First Nations that lived here at the time of colonization. An initial period of cooperative interreliance grounded in norms of equality and mutual dependence, described eloquently by John Ralston Saul in his book, A Fair Country, was supplanted in the 19th century by the ethos of exclusion and cultural annihilation. Early laws forbade treaty Indians from leaving allocated reservations. Starvation and disease were rampant. Indians were denied the right to vote. Religious and social traditions like potlatch and sundance were outlawed. Children were taken from their parents and sent away to residential schools where they were forbidden to speak their own languages, forced to wear white men's clothing, forced to observe Christian religious practices, and sometimes subjected to sexual abuse. The objective was, and I quote from Sir John A. Macdonald, our revered forefather, take the Indian out of the child, end quote, and thus solve what was referred to as the Indian problem. Indianness was not to be tolerated, rather it must be eliminated. In the buzzword of the day, assimilation, 
in the language of the 21st century cultural genocide. We now understand that the policy of assimilation was wrong and that the only way forward is acknowledgement and acceptance of the distinct values, traditions, and religions of the descendants of the original inhabitants of the land we call Canada. In a moving ceremony in Parliament in 2008, the Prime Minister formally apologized to Canada's First Nations people for the abuses of the residential school system. A Truth and Reconciliation Commission whose report is about to be released was established. Yet the legacy of intolerance lives on in the lives of First Nation people and their children. A legacy of too much poverty, too little education, and over-representation of Aboriginal people in our courts. Trop de pauvreté, pas assez d'éducation, et une surreprésentation des autochtones devant les tribunaux. Three lessons emerge from the Canadian experience with tolerance and intolerance. The first lesson is this. Intolerance, the marginalization of difference, doesn't work. It may seem to provide a solution short term, but in the long run, it will fail. The second lesson is that intolerance imposes inhumane and unacceptable costs in terms of human suffering, human dignity, and lost human and economic potential. The third lesson is that the way forward is not to use intolerance to try in a vain attempt to eliminate difference but to embrace tolerance in the spirit of reconciliation. These lessons from Canadian experience are replicated wherever intolerance has been systematically imposed. From the Nazi attempts to eliminate Jews, gypsies, and homosexuals, to the apartheid of South Africa, to the genocide of Rwanda, the lessons are always the same. Intolerance doesn't work and imposes enormous and unacceptable costs. Ultimately, the only way forward is the way of tolerance. This brings me to the complication, the limits on tolerance. For a society made up of a people who share different cultures, religions, practices, and opinions, which means virtually every society in the modern world, it seems, these days, Tolerance is the only way forward, but even tolerance may have its limits. It is one thing to accept the right of others to beliefs and practices that one does not agree with. It is another thing to stand by and allow those beliefs and practices to be used in a way that imposes harm on innocent individuals and groups. The jurisprudence of the Supreme Court of Canada accepts that some things cannot be tolerated. In Big M versus the Queen, our seminal case on freedom of religion, the court held that freedom of religion, while broadly interpreted, does not extend to practices that harm others. The state is therefore permitted to ban religious practices that harm others, to say those practices will not be tolerated in Canada. Similarly, in R versus Keekstra, the court held that hate speech is not protected by the guarantee of freedom of expression because of the harm which such speech may produce. Tolerance stops where harm begins. This much seems clear. The difficulty, however, lies in defining harm. Religious zealots throughout history have claimed that enforcing assimilation they are in fact benefiting their victims by encouraging them to repent and to accept the true religion. As the priests of the Inquisition stoked the flames of the fires of execution, they prayed for the souls of the departed, just as 21st century jihadists claim their elimination of the infidel purges that infidel sin and purifies the state. We are not doing harm but good is the constant theme of these people throughout history. No one in Canada, I believe, would assert these arguments, but that is not my point. My point is rather that views on whether a particular practice is harmful may differ. 
Even if the harm threshold is set in a generous and tolerant fashion, as it is in Canada, people may argue about what constitutes harm and hence a permissible limit on the basic ethic of tolerance. For example, in France, it is an offense for a woman to wear a niqab that covers the face on the ground that to permit this harms women by fostering inequality. In other Western states, including Canada, the harm threshold is set higher, and women are generally allowed to wear face coverings. However, in a recent case in the Supreme Court of Canada, the court divided on the issue. The majority ruled that in some cases, allowing a witness to wear a face covering could harm the accused's right to cross-examine and make full answer in defense, which depends to some extent on facial expression. But the view wasn't unanimous. A dissenting judge said this harm would never suffice. And not long ago, the province of Quebec found itself engaged in a debate on what limits the state could impose on religious practices of people engaged in the provision of public services surrounding a proposed charter of values. All this to say that the line drawing exercise can be very difficult. What constitutes harm and when that harm will justify a decision not to tolerate a particular practice may be neither clear nor easy to decide. Ce qui constitue un préjudice, c'est quand ce préjudice justifie de ne pas tolérer une pratique donnée sont les questions qui se révèlent ni simples ni faciles à trancher. Still, in a society based on tolerance, the lines must sometimes be drawn. How is this to be done? The first avenue is civil debate. When issues like those that I have been discussing arise, they find themselves discussed and debated in coffee shops, living rooms, and newspapers, on television and on chat lines. At best, this civil debate may produce some sort of consensus. Failing that, it provides the context for legislatures and the courts, if called upon, to draw the necessary lines or decline to draw them between tolerance and intolerance. This brings me to the third and final portion of my talk, maintaining a tolerant society. I have suggested that absolute tolerance may not be possible. In some cases, limits must be imposed, whether by civil society, the legislatures, or the courts. I have also suggested that in a modern, multicultural, democratic, pluralistic state, tolerance must be the norm. Respect for difference is the essential glue that binds such a society together and allows it to function and move forward in constructive harmony. In this, the final part of my talk, I turn to the question of how a society can maintain the basic norm of tolerance. Comment pouvons-nous maintenir une société axée sur le norme de tolérance? Three things, I believe, are essential to maintaining the norm of tolerance. Acceptance of the inherent human dignity of every person, inclusive institutions and cultural attitudes in civil society, and the rule of law. Allow me to say a few words about each. First, acceptance of the human dignity of each person. The idea that each person is possessed of innate worth and dignity is deeply rooted in Western religion and thought. The great religious traditions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam saw man as created in the image of God. Cicero in Dophysis spoke of the dignity of human beings, qua humans. In the Holy Quran, we read, and I quote, O mankind, be careful of your duty to your Lord who created you from a single soul and joined your hearts in love, end quote. A millennium and a half later, nope, I, that's a bit, uh, a bit exaggerated, uh, but somewhat later, Kant asserted in profound philosophical terms the unconditional absolute value of the moral law inherent in human beings and drew from it the necessity for each person to treat others not as means, but as ends in themselves. 
In the aftermath of the Holocaust and World War II, the concept of human dignity moved beyond the domains of theology and philosophy and entered the discourse of human rights. The United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 set out a clear, in clear and ringing terms the intrinsic worth and value of every human life. In the, la, in the half century that followed, the precept was ensconced in seminal constitutional documents around the world. The principle of innate human dignity of each person may be seen as fundamental to all other rights. Thus, Justice Bertha Wilson, the first woman to sit on the Supreme Court of Canada, wrote, and I quote, the idea of human dignity finds expression in almost every right and freedom guaranteed by the Charter. Individuals are afforded the right to choose their own religion and their own philosophy of life, the right to choose with whom they will associate and how they will express themselves, the right to choose where they will live and what occupation they will pursue. To read Justice Wilson's words is to understand how important the concept of human dignity is to a pluralistic, tolerant society. If individuals, by virtue of their innate human dignity, have the right to choose their own religion and philosophy of life, we should respect that choice. No individual or group of individuals has the right to impose their beliefs, practices, or choices on another individual. That is the ethic of human dignity. To be sure, the right to the choices that human dignity affirms is not absolute. Sometimes human dignity conflicts with other values, requiring us to balance them. How a society de defines the core content of human dignity may evolve, as the German Constitutional Court has stated. And care must be taken to ensure meaningful and realistic content to the idea of human dignity, lest it become, as philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer warned, and I quote, the shibboleth of perplexed and empty-headed moralists. Despite these qualifications, the concept of human dignity, that every person has innate value and worth, and hence the right to make, a funda to make fundamental life choices, remains the basic underpinning uh, of the attitude of tolerance we expect in a diverse multicultural society. The second condition of maintaining a tolerant pluralistic society are inclusive institutions and cultural habits. In 2010, His Highness Yaga Khan presented the 10th annual La Fontaine Baldwin Lecture in Toronto. His subject was pluralism. Quoting Adrian Clarkson in her 2007 lecture, he cautioned that we cannot count on the power of love to solve our problems, and stated, and I quote, learning to live with people we may not particularly like will require concerted, deliberate efforts to build social institutions and cultural habits which take account of difference, which see diversity as an opportunity rather than as a burden. There are so many ways we can build social institutions and cultural habits that take account of difference. Federal arrangements, laws and courts can help us live together in an ethic of tolerance. But as the Aga Khan counseled, we need to go further. We need independent ed educational institutions, he stated. On this front, I find it reassuring that a number of Canadian provinces now require teaching of the world's major religions as a mandatory part of the curriculum for public and private schools. It is also reassuring that, and I quote here, Canada is recognized as a leader in coping with the challenges of a diverse and polyglot student body, end of quote. This comes from a recent report of the United Nations Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. We're doing reasonably well here in education. But we also need other inclusive institutions of civil society, institutions that focus on bringing people of diverse backgrounds together. A problem can be the ghetto, people who live in their own little national 
communities. We need to develop institutions that bring people from different backgrounds, that bring new Canadians together with others, that show them how they can become part of the fabric of Canada and help them do that. We need, and fortunately in Canada we possess, an independent press prepared to report not only on conflicts between different values and norms and practices, but on the good news stories that celebrate the difference and the enrichment diversity and pluralism bring to our lives. Above all, we need in all our institutions, religious and secular, leaders who understand the richness of pluralism, the importance of living together, and the basic ethic of tolerance that this requires. Inclusive institutions are supported by and in turn promote a social mindset that sustains pluralism. As His Highness put it in 2010, and I quote, institutional reforms will have lasting meaning only when there is a social mindset to sustain them. And then he stated, in this particular variation of the chicken and egg conundrum, there is a profound reciprocal relationship between institutional and cultural variables. How we think shapes our institutions, and then our institutions shape us. He went on, as societies come to think in pluralistic ways, I believe they can learn a lesson from the Canadian experience. The importance of resisting both assimilation and homogenation, the subordination and dilution of minority cultures on the one hand, or the attempt to create some new transcendent blend of identities on the other. The final plank in maintaining a tolerant pluralistic society I believe to be the rule of law. One of the essential tasks of a multicultural society is to remain, maintain respect for the human dignity of each person and the individual life choices of the person, even where those choices differ from those of the majority. In a word, to maintain a society where tolerance is the norm. This cannot be done without the rule of laws, a system of laws backed by an independent judiciary. L'une des tâches essentielles d'une société multiculturelle consiste à assurer le respect de la dignité humaine de chacun de celui de ses choix de vie, même lorsque ses choix se distinguent de ceux de la majorité. Il faut qu'il ait la règle de droit. In a diverse multicultural society, the law is the guarantor of the right to hold opinions and follow practices that diverge from the norm. Without the law, there is no check on the power of the majority to limit or check the beliefs and practices they do not agree with. The confidence of the citizen that her dignity and right to choose to be different will be respected and enforced through the rule of law is the bedrock upon which civilized intercourse in a diverse society rests. Fear and hatred of the other in our midst is a disease that can destroy social peace. The best antidote to this fear is the assurance that everyone's basic right to hold their own beliefs and follow their own practices within the constitutional norms provided provided that they do not do harm to others, is the, is, is the assurance of protection by the legal system. This requires that citizens must have access to the legal system and that the legal system respond with integrity even in the face of overweening pressure from the majority that may see the belief or practice as aberrant or wrong. It also requires commitment to a culture of legality, a culture that encourages debate about particular decisions while maintaining respect for the principles and processes of the Constitution and the law that we all share. Let me conclude. The debate between tolerance and intolerance is one of the great debates of our times. Canada, like most other countries around the world, is a pluralistic, multicultural nation. 
It can move forward only by respecting the norm of tolerance. That does not mean that everything must be tolerated. A civilized society has no choice but to condemn certain practices that cause harm to others and injure citizens or undermine the fabric of peaceful coexistence. But it means the basic rule must be tolerance. Preserving that tolerance is grounded in, res uh, preserving that tolerance is grounded in respect for the innate human dignity of each person. It compels us to cultivate and sustain inclusive institutions and attitudes, and it demands an unwavering commitment to the rule of law. Living together in the ethic of tolerance is not easy, but I, for one, believe it is worth the effort. Merci beaucoup.